6th of August this year, Ukraine launched a surprise incursion into the Russian territory of Kursk and Belgorod. The audacious attack caught Moscow completely off guard. They didn't anticipate that Ukraine would turn the tables and strike back with the first and biggest invasion of Russian territory by any foreign power since World War II. Ukraine has claimed that it has more Russian land than Putin's army managed to seize of Ukraine since the start of 2024. As per the estimates, Ukraine claims to have seized 1,263 square kilometers of Russian territory in two weeks of the Kursk invasion. Whereas Russian forces have occupied 1,175 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory since the beginning of the year. But Kyiv's claim masks the ground reality. 18% of Ukraine's territory is occupied by Russia as of May 2024. Russia diverted thousands of troops from occupied territory inside Ukraine to counter the threat. Russia's President Vladimir Putin met the top military officials to discuss the situation in Kursk region. Kremlin has said that there will be a response to Ukraine's incursion, and the idea of ceasefire talks with Kyiv is no longer relevant. Но так же, как в борьбе с терроризмом мы добились своих целей, мы добьемся этих целей и на этом направлении, в борьбе с неонацизмом. И, безусловно, покараем преступников. В этом не может быть никаких сомнений. Но когда я говорю о морально-нравственной стороне... Ukraine's offensive has transformed opinions of a war that many believed was moving slowly but surely toward a Russian victory. In this episode of We on Wide Angle, we explain how exactly the incursion unfolded, whether the attack is changing the dynamics of the war after two and a half years, and what will be Putin's next move. Earlier in the month of August, Ukraine executed an unprecedented cross-border incursion into Russian territory, marking it one of the most substantial attacks on Russia since World War II. The operation pushed nearly a thousand Ukrainian troops, supported by tanks and artillery, deep into the Kursk region. The attack not only left Russian President Vladimir Putin by surprise, it forced thousands of residents to flee and prompted the Kremlin to declare a state of emergency. First of all, having assessed the situation, we began to evacuate people. This was a rather difficult problem because the Ukrainian armed forces' sabotage and reconnaissance groups were shelling the civilian population, shelling the ambulances, which, at the risk of their own lives, sacrificing themselves. There are cases where doctors died while evacuating the population. We involved the administration of the village councils, the regional administration and the voluntary people's militias. On the 19th of August, Russian Ministry of Emergencies released videos showing civilians evacuated from the Kursk region. Nearly 200,000 people were being evacuated following the attack. Russia has imposed a tight security regime in the Kursk, Bryansk and Belgorod regions. Some of the evacuees from Russia's Kursk region are temporarily moved to an accommodation center in the Russian town of Azov. An evacuee, Tatyana Pachina, shares her traumatic experience of fleeing. We were driving at a high speed. I was praying to God that we don't meet with an accident. 
It's only when we stopped the car to drink water that we realized that we were really running away from everything. Another evacuee, Anna Erokina, also recounted her hurried escape. There was shelling. What do you call them? Shells. Shells were falling quite close, three meters from the house. And we were standing in the corridor like this and we were appealing to God. Let them not hit the house. We have children sleeping there. Ukraine has reportedly captured hundreds of Russian conscripts and has destroyed several bridges over the same river cutting off a key Russian logistics base in Glushkovo from the frontline forces. Look at these satellite images taken on the 26th of August that show damages of two bridges. But what was the intent behind Ukraine's Kursk incursion? The Ukrainian attack came after weeks of military setbacks in the eastern Donetsk region. Observers have listed three probable objectives of the incursion. Let's understand. The first probability. Many experts have pointed that the incursion is looked at as a bargaining chip. Ukraine wants to use the captured territory for any future negotiation with Russia. My best guess is that Ukraine, you know, on the one hand, wanted to push back against Russia, um, perhaps to increase any leverage that they might have in any upcoming negotiations. Um, and um, it also seems to have been an attempt to uh, draw Russian military attention away from where they were pushing ahead. Um, so in a way, I guess it was a gamble to try and open a second front um, to, to try and draw Russian military away from where they were making advances against Ukraine and sort of trying to win back territory. Um, and that seems to have worked pretty well. You know, like Russia has had to recommit troops from where they were previously, um, sort of more in the Crimea region um, and moving, moving um, on Ukrainian territory in that direction um, over to their own border. It has also been suggested that Ukraine wants to boost the morale of its own people and troops after failing to stop the Russian advance in the east. The operation was intended to signal that the Ukrainian military could carry out a successful offensive even with its dwindling resources. Ukraine also wants to show the West, which is helping it with arms and funds, that it is not yet a lost cause. They are showing the world that they are not down and out, and but they are also showing, in a sense, what the Russians have done to them for so long. Because I think it is, it does fade from our memories. It's not in the news every day. It's not. Um, you know, Ukraine fatigue is real and sets in and affects policymakers and thus affects support. And so it's a, it's a morale boost to everybody from the Ukrainian army and from the Ukrainian population to the highest echelons of the U.S. administration. Another probability is the incursion could also be a battlefield tactic to force Russia to divert its forces from the battlefields in eastern Ukraine where they are coming close to fulfilling their goal of capturing all of the Donetsk region. As Kursk incursion progressed, governor of Bryansk Oblast Alexander Bogoma claimed that Russian forces foiled the Ukrainian attempt to seize land. Bryansk Oblast lies west of embattled Kursk Oblast, north of Ukraine's Chernihiv and Sumy Oblasts, and east of the Belarusian border. The attack took place in Kursk, located 530 kilometers from Moscow. Kursk is a city and administrative center of Kursk Oblast, Western Russia. Kursk is one of the oldest cities in Russia. The region plays an important role in the gas supply chain. 
the last transit station through which gas flows from Russia to Europe via Ukraine. It's located near the town of Sudza. Interestingly, despite the raging battle, Kyiv has allowed the flow of Russian gas via Ukraine. The Russian gas exports to Europe has, however, decreased since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Kursk, the place, was also once the site of a massive World War II tank battle. In 1943, the Battle of Kursk was fought between the forces of Germany and the Soviet Union near Kursk in southwestern Russia. The Battle of Kursk resulted in the victory of the Soviet Union. Now in 2024, about eight decades later, a major offensive is once again playing out in the Kursk Oblast region. In fact, on Ukraine's Independence Day on the 24th of August, Zelensky said that the war has returned to Russia. Russia went to us with a war, broke не лише суверенні кордони, а й межі жорстокості та здорового глузду, безмежно прагнучи одного – знищити нас. Натомість сьогодні ми відзначаємо 33-й день незалежності України. А те, що ніс на нашу землю ворог тепер вернулося у його дім. I think the counteroffensive so far has done a lot for morale. I mean, Ukrainians know that the alternative to the war, if it if it was to end badly for them, um, isn't good. And so that is part of why they have been so committed and so behind the government. Um, and I think this uh, very successful counteroffensive has meant that there is a real sense that, you know, Ukraine could win the war. And so um, that has really sort of elevated people's moods and like increased the morale. So I think as long as Zelensky can can ride that wave um, that is going to be really good for him. But um, it could, of course, also sort of go in the other direction if uh, if Russian attacks intensify as a result. Despite the shock of Kyiv's incursion, Russia has continued to advance in eastern Ukraine and is closing in on the city of Pokrovsk in the Donetsk region. Russia and Ukraine have so far exchanged 115 prisoners of war from each side. With the United Arab Emirates acting as an intermediary. It was the UAE's seventh mediation effort this year between the two countries. Both sides have carried out periodic prisoner swaps via intermediaries. Since the war began nearly two and a half years ago, the UAE ministry has said that the total number of captives exchanged through its mediation efforts now stand at 1,788. Ukraine confirmed that it had used weapons supplied by the United States to attack Russian bridges over the Sium River in Kursk. Here's about the foreign weapons Ukraine is using. Ukraine used the US-supplied HIMARS or High Mobility Artillery Rocket System during its attacks on bridges in Russia. High Mobility Artillery Rocket System is a light multiple rocket launcher developed in the late 1990s for the United States Army. It is a highly effective mobile artillery system designed to meet the demands of the modern battlefield. Ukraine's military also says it used high-precision U.S. glide bombs for strikes in Russia's Kursk region. And that it has captured some territory in eastern Ukrainian region of Kharkiv. On the 22nd of August, Ukraine's Air Force released a video saying it has used a U.S.-made GBU-39 bomb to strike a Russian platoon command post in the Kursk region of Russia. It is also believed that German-supplied weapons have been used in the Kursk incursion. Germany is one of the largest suppliers of weapons to Ukraine, second only to the United States. 
It supplies mortar infantry fighting vehicles, leopard battle tanks, air defense systems, drones and rocket launch systems to Kyiv. Kyiv's allies, including the United States, are currently supplying weapons to Ukrainian forces. But such liberties come with imposed restrictions on how and when they can be used inside Russia. On the 31st of May this year, United States President Joe Biden eased a ban on Ukraine using U.S. weapons inside Russian territory to help the country defend its northeastern Kharkiv region from attack. Until Biden's decision, Ukraine was restricted to using U.S. weapons inside Ukrainian territory only. This move marked a huge change in U.S. policy. However, Ukraine is still not allowed by Washington to use U.S. long-range missiles to hit targets inside Russia. Amid concerns that targets deep inside Russian territory could escalate the conflict. President Zelensky is urging the Biden administration to remove the curbs. Знову знов повертає усіх нас до завдання далекобійності, до необхідності дати нашим силам оборони достатньо далекобійної зброї, яка може знищувати терористів саме там, звідки вони завдають. In April this year, Biden signed off on military support to Ukraine worth almost $61 billion, of which about $23 billion is being used to replenish military stockpiles and $14 billion goes to the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. Also, 13 nations have now given permission for Ukraine to use Western weapons such as tanks, artillery systems and infantry fighting vehicles inside Russia. These countries include France, UK, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, the Netherlands, Sweden, the Czech Republic, Finland, Denmark, Norway and Canada. On the other hand, Russia has hit out at Western and NATO countries for what it sees as their involvement in the incursion by supplying weapons to Ukraine. Although it began supplying the long-range U.S. missiles back in April, after hesitating for months, when they supplied those missiles, they told Ukraine, you can use them against Crimea, you can use them against occupied territory, you cannot use them inside Russia. Uh, and the U.S. continues to, to say that. In fact, equally important, the U.S. is effectively vetoing Ukraine using British or French long-range missiles, which they do have and which could be used immediately against, and let's be clear what they're being used for, against the Russian launch sites, against Russian air bases and other sites which are firing these missiles and firing these drones. President Vladimir Putin has accused Ukraine of trying to attack the Kursk nuclear plant. The nuclear plant is located in the Kursk region of western Russia, where fierce fighting has raged since Ukraine's surprise incursion. On the 27th of August, the International Atomic Energy Agency Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi visited the Kursk nuclear power station to evaluate the nuclear safety and security conditions at the power plant. Grossi warned of the danger of a serious nuclear accident there. Meanwhile, Russia said it wants the UN nuclear watchdog to take a more objective and clearer stance on nuclear safety. The IAEA has urged both sides throughout the 30-month war to refrain from fighting around nuclear plants to avoid a catastrophic incident. We see the plant uh, still operating, but at the same time, the fact that the plant is operating uh, make it uh, even more serious in terms of an eventual action against it. Um, when a plant is operating, the temperature is much higher, and if uh, there was the case uh, of an impact or something that could affect 
uh, it, uh, there will be serious consequences. As of now, Russia has unleashed one of the biggest attacks on Ukraine in a single day. Russian forces fired more than a hundred missiles and drones targeting almost half of Ukraine. The attacks were aimed at weakening Ukrainian energy infrastructure, though Kyiv claims that it managed to down most of the Russian projectiles. The Russian forces have seized several settlements in the Donetsk region and successfully repelled Ukrainian counterattacks from multiple directions. I think it's very much a game plan. Uh, Russia has uh, suffered some very uh, significant reverses in recent weeks with the Ukrainian invasion of Russian territory. And this is clearly a retaliation for that and for Ukrainian strikes against Russian military facilities. The key difference is that uh, the Ukrainian attacks have largely targeted Russian military facilities and capabilities, whereas Russia is hitting primarily civilian targets in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has recently said that his troops' incursion into the Russia's Kursk region is part of a victory plan that he will present to US President Joe Biden in September. On the other end, Russia has signaled it will not engage in any peace talks with Ukraine. Will the outcome of Zelensky's gamble be far-reaching and catastrophic? <laughs>